me. My name is Shannon and I'm part of the community engagement and events team at Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. I want to thank all of you very much for joining us today for Family Law Now Live's presentation on divorced and separated parents, back to school tips, tricks, and common disputes. I'm going to get started with about with a bit of housekeeping. I'll do some introductions and let you know what's on the agenda for today before handing things over to our panelists. And as we are presenting virtually today, as always, we do apologize in advance for any technical issues that may come up. Uh, once, things, once I pass things over to our presenters, I'll be available behind the scenes for any questions or tech issues. So if you're having any challenges throughout the webinar or have any questions, please contact me at shannon at russellalexander.com and I'll do my best to help resolve the issue. In this one hour presentation, we have Bill, Susanna and Jason who will be covering the following topic. <laughs> No agreement on enrollment and what to do, notice and self-help, urgent motions, voice of the child, status quo, best interests of the child, child support guidelines and children's expenses, post-secondary expenses, child support during post-secondary education, and there will also be a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar, so if you haven't already, please feel free to send in your questions for our panelists. Um, and we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. We did get a lot in advance, um, but like I said, we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. Um, and if you haven't already sent in your questions, you'll notice that the chat box has been disabled and this is just to allow everyone to stay anonymous to other audience members, um, but you do have the option to send through the Q&A box anonymously. So please send in your questions. We love to hear from you. And so without further ado, it's now my pleasure to introduce today's host from Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. We have Susanna, who is an associate lawyer who is fully trained in collaborative practice. She has over seven years of family law experience and works hard to achieve favorable outcomes for her clients in their family law cases. Susanna approaches client consultations with a compassionate but analytical mindset and endeavors to provide her clients with the very best representation possible. She is also passionate about supporting local and international charities and humanitarian aid organizations, including World Vision International, ERDO, and the Salvation Army. Next, we have Jason, and Jason is an associate lawyer with over 20 years of legal experience. Jason excels at helping his clients reach resolutions in their family law issues and finds it very rewarding being a family lawyer as it gives him the opportunity to support people in moving forward and starting the next chapter of their lives. Through his many years of experience, Jason has been praised for his hard work in providing a personal touch with his clients and has become known for his patience and attention. Lastly, we have, we have Bill, who is a managing associate lawyer at our firm. His courtroom experience includes numerous motions, several full-blown trials, and he also has had the privilege of winning a major family law victory at the Ontario Court of Appeal in 2014, which prevented the imposition of a proposed two-year deadline on property claims by common law spouses. When he's not practicing law, he loves spending time playing music with his band, Soul Custody. So now that you know a little bit more about our team, I'm gonna pass things over to Bill to get started. Uh, thanks, Shannon. Um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, the question today in, uh, is um, back to school issues, and it's, amazing. it's hard to believe we're already there. Um, but this is the, the season for, um, uh, uh, for that kind of stuff. And before we get into it, um, I just wanted to uh, uh, go through this poll and see uh, what's your reason for joining um, today's uh, presentation. So if uh, you could just go ahead and fill out that poll, please. We'll share the results when it's in. I'm not allowed to vote, feeling left out. No, you're not alone. I can't vote. Yeah. And the answer, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, we, we usually have a mixture. Okay, we've got a lot of legal professionals uh, today, which is uh, not unusual. We've got some people going through uh, separation or divorce. Uh, we've got people wanting to learn for a loved one and uh, other. So uh, thanks uh, for joining us. Hopefully this will be informative. Um, now, again, it's uh, the back to school problem. Um, typically arises in August. Uh, um, uh, the parents don't agree on, on where uh, a child or, or children 
should be enrolled. And um, uh, the question is, what um, what do we do? And uh, um, Jason and Susanna are both uh, excellent lawyers. They've had experience in this. And maybe uh, I'll just throw it over to Jason first and kind of give um, give an overview of what of what kind of stuff you've seen. Well, I think that you get people who have agreements and people that have orders and people that have nothing. And I think that that dictates sometimes what they do. And, you know, it's it's last minute. You know, some people, no one thinks about this in, in June, as you said, they think about it in August. And, uh, you know, it's rush, rush, rush. And, uh, you know, summer is a time to put off things <laughs> because it's nice out. We're so excited in, in this country to have nice weather that we can enjoy and do stuff with our family. So um, this tends to be last minute. Uh, we're hope That's why we're doing it now. But we're hoping after we talk to you today, you think about it a little earlier if this is going to be an issue next year for you yeah. or now. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I know um, <clears throat> we had um, uh, one of the lawyers in our firm uh, had a case where um, one of the parents sort of ran off with the, the kids and um, was going to enroll them somewhere without the consent of the other parent. And uh, there's a lot of things you can do, but one of the practical suggestions um, that uh, was made was uh, write a letter to the principal of, of the, the school and say, uh, guess what? Um, Dad doesn't actually have sole decision-making uh, uh, responsibility. I am not consenting to the child going to your school. Um, and it was even suggested that not only send that letter to the principal, but even the superintendent of education in the region. So that's just a practical tip. Um, but that's separate from what you can do um, in a court or, um, uh, you know, on an urgent motion. And now, Jason, what, what, what do you what do you do uh, um, if, if there is a disagreement, you're going to have to go to court? Well, what I think you need to consider first sort of joys working at home, is that um, if the decision is going to be made by a judge, made by an arbitrator, um, you know, how you behave prior to that is important. And, and that's what I want to focus on right now, is that um, you need to communicate and um, give notice to your former spouse of what you want to do. Let them know that you want this school. Um, talk about it. Even if, you know, you have the ability to make the decision alone, you have an agreement, you have an order that says that communication is key and early because that person may disagree with your, your former spouse may disagree with your choice. And if you make that decision right now, there's not much they can do about it except run to court and, and deal with it urgently. Yeah. So you give them enough notice, you give them enough time. And, you know, why should you do this? Well, you're communicating, you're making a major decision. And if it's yours alone, even, it's still a major decision about where your children should go to school. It could affect a lot about their life, their peer group, et cetera. So I think you should be communicating that. That's what the court will want to see you're doing. Giving Absolutely. And, and as um, the late, great Phil Epstein uh, said many times, when it comes to parenting issues, generally, be nice. That is what you want to do. And that's what's going to be in front of the judge, your behavior um, leading up to the court appearance. Um, now, there's uh, often um, this time of year urgent um, issues about this. I mean, school starts in a week and there's no agreement. So a lot of times uh, people want to get in, uh, in front of a judge urgently. You know, Susanna, um, uh, can you talk, talk a bit about uh, the landscape of the urgent motion? I think you're muted. Are you muted? Susan. I am so there sorry. you go. Thank the you. urgent motion, the proverbial <laughs> urgent motion. Thanks, Bill. So generally speaking in, in family court, you're not allowed to bring an urgent motion before you've had your first case conference with a judge. And that judge's role is to canvas the issues with the parties and help them come to a resolution. However, like we said, school is almost a week away, and there are some cases where parents create a sense of urgency because they can't agree on where the child should go to school for whatever reason. So 
you bring an urgent motion and you have to ask a judge to decide. And I agree with you, Bill, when you're writing to the other side and when you're communicating, you have to be nice because you have to communicate in such a way that you know this communication at any point in time could end up in front of a judge. And the judge is going to read it all. And maybe they would agree with one parent over the other. Or maybe they would criticize both. Um, you know, when you're writing to the other side, it would be helpful if, like we said, you can set out your reasons why you want a child to go to one school over the other. We do not encourage parents to engage in self-help and just go ahead and enroll a child, even if the other parent does not agree. Um, you yeah. have to show that you've taken steps to negotiate the issue, right? And there may be a situation where the child is older. And maybe the child has his own views and preferences about where he wants to go. And we're going to talk about that a little bit too, but. Yeah, that's, that's can... right, um, Susanna, yeah. absolutely true. And, and that's, that actually leads into the next uh, topic we've got, which is um, the so-called voice of the child, um, which is, uh, you know, there's different ways of, of getting the, the, um, um, the voice of the child heard but before we get into that let's do uh, the second poll so if you can't agree on where the children go to school what do you do follow your order agreement do whatever you want homeschool or rush to court so let's do that poll well and while the audience is doing that um jason maybe you can talk a bit about the voice of the child um and how that but how can you bring that into all this well, you know, I, a little further what Susanna was talking about, self-help remedies, they're, they're, you, you don't make unilateral decisions. You don't, you don't do things like that. And so, you know, voice the child is, we get, we get a lot of our clients saying, but, you know, my son or daughter tells me this and they want to go here. Um, and then the other parent says, no, no, they say they want to go here. Um, so let's say you've got that problem. Let's say you've got it where you don't know uh, if the child is being honest with one parent or the other. Um, you don't know uh, if they're uh, just trying to, uh, um, you know, sh show no alignment, and no favoritism to either parent, or they're being dishonest, or for whatever reason. Um, so, how do we get their voice out there? How do we get a child um, to be able to say to someone that isn't mom or dad? This is what I want because I tell my clients, you know, if a child didn't want you to, um, to, to uh, um, have a, uh, um, you know, they didn't want to go to the school you wanted them to go to. That might be very hard for them to say to you, depending upon their age, depending upon their relationship with you. So, uh, you know, they often are in a situation where honesty and, and, and giving that information is, is complicated. So, I can say to you that, um, you know, like any good self-help remedy, don't just put the child exactly where they want to go. Um, don't beg for forgiveness later and just do whatever you want. Um, you know, that does work occasionally. Um, but my advice is you seek permission first. So here's what we do with children. Um, if you're in court, one remedy available to you is that you can have a uh, social worker appointed through the office of the children's uh, the office of the children's lawyer. I can see most people say follow your order agreement, which is good answer. That is that is the good answer. Right answer. Or rush to court if you have to, but don't just start homeschooling. Yeah. Or just so tell the kids you don't need no education. We're not that's going to do not do that. Judges hate self help remedies. They really do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they, 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 it's a unilateral thing. Uh, I say, don't beg for forgiveness later. So with children, yeah. here's what we do. If you're in court. Yeah. How important is status quo in this? I have sort of used Latin. Well, I'll get to that. But voice of the child, let me just explain that a bit. You need to consider that if you're in court, there is a government branch of the Office of Children's Lawyer, and they can help in multiple ways. One way they can do is they can say, we will prepare a report, have a social worker speak to child only, and report to everyone about what child wants. And if you have the time, um, you know, because something isn't urgent, 
that's a good remedy. It takes a couple of weeks, at most three, okay, in my experience. If you have more time, another remedy the Office of Children's Lawyer can give you, and you have, these are things that are, I say in court because they're made by order by the court. And the court says, I want to know what child has to say. Let's have a voice to child report. Another way they can do it is you can appoint a lawyer for the child. And the lawyer can report about what the child's interests are. That's very different than their best interest. And we're going to talk about that later. Because, you know, a child may want something that isn't necessarily in their best interest. But in any event, a lawyer can be appointed. And that takes a little longer. Um, they have, they're going to speak to probably more than just the child. Um, they're on a panel. They, the the Office of Children's Lawyer picks them. They pay them. Um, it's not picked by you. Uh, you don't like the person. Too bad. So it's again, it's an assistance for the court if they have a problem. That takes a little while. And they can say no. They can say no to these requests. So if you're in court and you make this request or the judge thinks it's appropriate, an order is made. And this is a way that then they report, the, the voice of child repair report says what the child wants. We make about what, would, what that means. Lawyer reports on what their interests are, what their views and preferences are, make of that whatever it is. And then if you're not in court, or if the OCL, Office of Children's Lawyer, says, no, not helping you guys, your remedies are the exact same things, more or less, and uh, just pay the persons privately. Um, that's the difference. You have some control. But like, what you should not do is say, oh, well, I know the court appoints a lawyer for kids. And I know the court does report for kids. So I'm just going to take you know Johnny or Sally down to the local social worker or a lawyer and say, you tell them what you told me. Or bring them to your, you know, bring them into your office and say, bring Johnny or Sally down. I'll chat with them about what they told you. And then it's, you're, I'm your lawyer, so I've got some magic now. And it means it's more, use, more useful and more helpful. No, that's yeah. a self-help remedy. That's saying, I'm picking the lawyer for the child. I'm picking the social worker for the child. And also presuming that the other parent, your former spouse, is even content and will agree that they should speak to someone. Maybe they don't want someone. It's a stranger. And we tell children not to talk to strangers. So if you're going to bring them into a social worker's office, you better have their parents' consent. If you're going to bring them into a lawyer's office, you better have their parents' consent. If you don't, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So That's right. And, and they, uh, they often, um, a lot of times the social workers or the OCL, uh, most of the time, they're, they're very aware if there's undue parental pressure on the child to say one they're thing. For, they're looking for that. I mean, that yeah, yeah. child report on top of reporting on the, you know, the views and preferences, the child would also say, I think the child was influenced or not. Yeah. I mean, there's three things that matter most. And it's, you want a child to consistently be saying the same thing. You want them to be very clear on what they're saying. And you want it to come without influence. If you don't have those three, it's useless. Yeah. The judge will say, I don't know what to do with this. I mean, they might say that anyway. Yeah, because um, maybe they, 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 you know, they, they, they don't make the choice. I mean, you know, Bill, you had another line from the great uh, late uh, Phil Epstein about right. children. Well, th thanks, uh, thanks, Jason. And uh, I want to move on to stat the, the, the issue of status quo, um, which generally I think uh, everyone sort of is aware of this, but um, generally courts want to preserve the status quo in the name of stability for the kids. Um, so how have you seen that play out? Uh, Susanna, do you want to talk about that at all? I know you weren't supposed to, but, <laughs> or I can get Jason to talk about it. Well, let me, I, I, I'll throw it to me and I'll throw it to I'll Susanna. throw it to you. Yeah. Add anything. Sorry, Susanna. I think, okay. So, I mean, look, you're now, I mean, I'm, I'm presuming a couple of things and, uh, presuming that you're now in front of a judge. They're going to make a decision or an arbitrator. They're going to make a decision. And um, you're, you, you basically, they're going to ask what's going on. That's the status quo, what's been happening. Yeah. And uh, it could be an agreement. It could be an order. It could be something you guys just were doing already. So the decision maker, they'll turn their mind to this. This will have possibly great weight. We say weight, think about it this way, like a judge takes a scale out in their mind and they put a little piece on one, you know, whatever little point you made on the scale and it tips the scale or it doesn't. So that's weight, like how strong is it? How important is it? This could have a lot of weight, the status quo for a judge. So for example, if a child wants to, uh, you know, he's always been in Catholic school, okay? 
and you're coming forward and saying um, they're about to enter high school and I don't want them going to the local Catholic school for high school. I want them going to the public school. Um, the judge is going to say, where have they been going? Catholic school. That could have a lot of weight. You may not be successful in wanting to change and to deviate from the status quo. Um, this does not mean that the status quo is followed all the time. We do get cases where a judge does deviate. You know, right. One thing Bill will talk about is best interest of the child. And I think that that's still important. But this is a piece. I mean, think about it. A judge, if they're making a decision like school, it's a puzzle. And, you know, if it's a 500 piece puzzle, how many pieces does status quo matter? It could be a 495. It could be five. Same with the voice of the child. It all depends upon what's going on in your case and the facts. Don't hang your hat on all of it being one thing. But the judge needs to make that puzzle. They need to see clearly. And if they don't have all the pieces to see clearly about what that picture looks like, they're going to keep adding to it. They're going to say, okay, let's get the voice of the child. Okay, tell me the status quo. Tell me more about the schools. Tell me more about this. Because I've only got 200 pieces of a 500-piece puzzle. And I don't know what the picture looks like. And I can't, like, just because I'm a judge doesn't mean I'm, you know, able to make every decision without the, the data. I need help. Help me. Help me well, with that's, that. a, that's a great way of, of describing it, Jason. And just, uh, if I could just add um, a general comment on status quo, which I think everyone listening probably knows, but it's worth repeating. Um, if you create a status quo illegitimately, um, we had a case where, this is more about parenting time, but uh, the children were on a week about schedule for years. And then suddenly one of the parents uh, kept the kids and, and uh, never uh, sent them back uh, to the other parent. That's not a status quo. That's a, well, it's an illegitimate status quo. So you can't do that, wait for six months and say, well, they're, they're used to staying with me. That's the status quo. Well, actually it is, but it's, you created it illegitimately so just just a point there that i think everyone knows it's worth repeating because people do that and uh it's not the way to go um the next topic is um the best interest of the child which is really the bottom line for most of family law and um the only comment uh i want to make about this it, it, it's hard to explain to a client that, you know what, it's not about you. Um, it's not about your convenience. It's not about the fact that it's gonna be easier for you to drop the kid off at this school rather than that school. Um, it's not about your, your preference. It's about the child. It's about the best interest of the child. The judge really doesn't care about the parents. I hate to put it that way, but um, that's the reality. So that sometimes is difficult to explain to a client. Um, because uh, again, family law is based on um, uh, the best interest of the child. So let's move on to, um, do we have another poll question, uh, Shannon? There we go. How do you share uh, special and extraordinary expenses, sometimes called section seven expenses? Always 50-50, portional, primary parent pays all, gets paid at a table amount. So let's, uh, let's let the audience uh, deal with that. And in the meantime, we can move on to, uh, um, to Susanna to talk about uh, the child support guidelines and special expenses. Susanna, over to you. Thanks, Bill. Um, before I get to that, I just wanted to go back to a point that Jason was talking about because it's very, um, when you listen to him, it shows that it's very important how you draft your materials that go before a judge. And, you know, if they don't have enough information to make a decision, then they will require more from you. So just be very mindful of what you're putting into your materials for, for the judge to read. And also, um, there is something called child focus mediation if there's time to do it before you run off to court where if you think your child is of a certain age and they are able to express their views um, both parents can engage a mediator 
who will also speak to the child about what it is they want. It's not necessarily a voice of the child report, but it's child child focused um, mediation. And one that's point a, that's just, a really good idea, Susanna. Yeah, one point I just wanted to go back to on urgent motions is, and I know Jason had a one such case like this, and I, I'm hoping he can share it with the audience, um, because cost is a relevant factor. If you bring an urgent motion and you lose, or the judge finds that you're partially successful, or you know, you've been the unreasonable parent, the judge has the ability to award costs against you, which means that you have to pay part or all of the other side's legal fees. Um, Jason, do you want to tell us a practical example about a case you just had recently where the judge awarded costs against dad? Yeah, it, it was about enrolling a child in high school and they disagreed. And dad was someone who um, wasn't seeing child very much. But in the order was a very old order that they had gotten. Um, and the child was like two, you know, the child's entering high school, so you can do the math. And um, it allowed for joint decision making. So dad, like Bill had said earlier, wrote to the school and said, I don't agree with my child being enrolled here. Didn't offer really any other solution. Didn't even live in the area. I was barely seeing child, but was very, had a strong opinion about child not going to the school mom chose for whatever reason. So at the end of the day, mom um, needed to ask for permission. She didn't she tried to enroll a child in school, um, presuming that the gap in time dad wouldn't oppose. Dad had never opposed anything before. And we had to get an order and costs were awarded. Dad didn't show up, um, didn't file any materials. So he was, you know, concerned about this to the point where he blocked it at every way he could. But when the decision was being taken out of his hands and was given to somebody else, he wasn't as interested. And that led to the costs. So, you know, I think, yeah, Susanna, you're right. Costs are something that can go against you, they can go for you. And you have to consider, is this battle one I'm willing to die on the hill for? And if I'm not, then don't play games because the legal fees and what our clients pay us is real money. And uh, judges say, if it's wasted money for something they should never have had to do, you're going to pay. Uh, and, and, you know, in that particular case, Thankfully, there were other issues and that money somehow got paid through those other issues. But, you know, the only unfortunate part is, is that, you know, you may have to go do this. And uh, it's the only issue you've got. Like in my case, 10 years ago, we got an order. Uh, we can't figure out school now. And I have to get an order. You get costs and you're like, OK, well, how do I get that money from the person? And you may not. But I guess you get your child enrolled in the school you want. So it's it's. It's a highly emotional issue that costs a lot of money, and it's a last resort to do those things, I would say. Yeah, that's uh, that's right. And sometimes they will put the costs on the child support, as we all know. But before we go um, to, uh, to Susanna to talk more about child support, uh, I'm just going to talk about the answers to the poll. It looks like uh, most people got the right answer. Uh, extra expenses are proportional to parents' income. Um, and it... Uh, it does not uh, come out of table amount because the definition of a special expense is it's over and above table amount. But uh, um, yeah, so it's, it's proportional um, to the incomes of the parents. So Susanna, can you talk some more about that and just special expenses and stuff? Right, so I'm glad, like you said, Bill, most of our audience got it right. It is proportional to income. There are too many parents out there who, you know, just avoid the issue or avoid conflict. They agree to pay for special expenses 50-50. Meanwhile, their income is nowhere near the other party's income and they are at a significant disadvantage. And I totally agree with you, Bill. Section seven expenses have nothing to do with the child support. It's money you pay over and above child support. So for those of you who think taking it out of child support is the answer, now you know the law on that. Yeah. Of course, if you want, you can always agree to share the expense differently. So if you want to agree to it 50-50, that's great. But um, if you didn't know the law before, you agreed to that. Now you know what the law is. And if you went to court, that is most likely what a judge is going to order. 
um, right now around this time of year, we always have a question about back to school supplies and how that should be paid. Um, generally speaking, it should be paid from a table amount of child support. Some parents choose to do it differently. Some parents say, okay, you pay for one child, you go shopping with one child, I'll go shopping with the other child. Some parents feel that, you know, for example, the kid needs a new winter jacket, new winter boots, uh, fall jacket. Those things are pricey, right? Um, you don't buy them very often, but they're pricey. And you may want to talk to your ex about how that is going to get paid. Um, generally speaking, it should come out of uh, child support as well, but we recognize that other parents can choose to do that differently. Um, we also want to cover the topic of before and after child care costs, before and after school. That is definitely a Section 7 expense. It's an expense that a parent must incur due to their own employment. Um, you know, they are not available before or after school until a certain time, and they have to enroll the child in these programs. Those are definitely Section 7 expenses and should be paid in proportion to incomes. And the way I explain it generally is if, you know, you each make $50,000, that is a 50-50 split. But if one person makes 60000 and the other makes forty, then proportionally speaking, one parent should be paying 40% of the expense and the other parent should be paying 60% of the expense. And it doesn't matter that, well, you need before and after care. I don't. Right, that's that's the way it gets paid. The same would apply to tutoring or private school tuition, or if you enroll your child in an extracurricular activities. I mean, if you were in family court, the judge would look at the incomes of the parties and what the parties did prior to separation, their standard of living. I mean, if you don't earn very much and you are insistent on enrolling the child in numerous activities, is that a fair Section 7 expense? Is that something you want to make the other parent responsible for when the, the, the prior uh, family situation didn't really allow for that or the incomes between the parties don't really allow for that. Those are things you, you need to take into account when you're looking at um, Section 7 expenses. No? And that's right, Susanna. And uh, another point that I think everyone knows, but it's worth repeating, is uh, you're not allowed to sign your child up for really expensive stuff and expect the other parent to pay. They have to consent yeah. to that. And it depends on whether they can afford it. It's an obvious point, but it's it's worth repeating because sometimes that that's, that gets lost. Um, but that's exactly right. And like something like private school, it's very expensive. Yeah, um, it can be. Now um, we've got uh, another um, poll question number uh, uh, four, I believe it is. Yeah, um, what should the child's contribution be? to this is post-secondary so it's not really back to school i guess it is back to university um do they have to pay it all they pay a third a half zero it depends so while everyone's um uh, answering that um perhaps jason can talk a bit about uh, the post-secondary landscape and how, how those expenses work yeah, I can. I, I, you know, we, we are getting your questions while we're doing this. And so I was looking at some of those questions and I just wanted to talk about those, Bill. For a second. Oh, so yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I can do that. What, what, and, you know, ones that are alive. So someone asked okay. if parents agreeing was one of my points. What about parents agreeing on a professional to speak to the child first if private? And I think that uh, that's a question. I said, that's what you would do is you would agree. You'd hire someone privately. Um, someone else asked if the judge endorsed an OCL is the opposing party still able to stop connection between the child and the OCL? And no, normally that's the court saying, I've ordered OCL involvement. If they agree to get involved, lack of cooperation is gonna be read right against them. Um, I've had clients say, I don't like the lawyer. I don't like the social worker. I say, you didn't hire them. You can't get rid of them. And that um, happens too. I've seen people say, I don't want the OCL talking to my kids. Like, you're screaming to the court that you got something to hide. 
Correct. I mean, like, think about it this way. It's a tool to help the court. So if they need it, you are, you're, 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 you're going to have a hard time now convincing a judge this was a bad choice. You, you're, you make your pitch to say no, but I've had circumstances where the parents want the OCL and the judge says, I don't need it. I'm not ordering it. I have had cases yeah. where the parents say nothing about OCL and judge goes, you know what? I'm ordering it because I need it. So it really isn't your choice. It's the judge's choice at the end of the day. And if you want to keep it private and hire someone, then you've got a little more choice, but you're in the court process and you're, you know, the, the benefit of the OCL is it's free. And so you, you, you know, get what you pay for, I guess. Um, in any, and a lot of times they don't, the OCL won't, like a judge can ask for the OCL. They can't, a lot of times the OCL will turn it down because they don't have the resources, but everyone knows that. So. Correct. So, I mean, some, someone asked at what age does the shared expenses end, age 21? Well, we're talking about post-secondary, and I guess the answer to that question is, no, it doesn't end, because I'm going to talk to you about these post-secondary expenses and what you're going to have to pay, um, potentially. Uh, and not one, two yes. degrees, two. Potentially, yes, yes. I've had some judges um, order uh, more than one degree. I've had some judges order a length of time, like five years, and if that means you do a three-year undergrad and a two-year master's or you do a four-year undergrad and a two-year master's, you only get the five years. So uh, that, that can all change. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I, I can keep talking. We haven't got results of the poll yet, um, but. Everyone was so offended okay. by the poll. Yes. Um, it does, I think that's the right answer. It does depend. I mean, um, generally um, uh, the child is expected to contribute that's for sure. Usually it's around 30%, but it does depend on whether the child can get a job and so, so on and so forth. But uh, they are expected to uh, to contribute something. I think that's yeah. the best answer. Sort yeah, of yeah, it depends, and yeah. Bill, their contribution can come in a variety of ways, right? If we look at groceries, scholarships, anything and everything they could apply for, we also look at OSAP. So yeah, that's a good point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they have to, they're expected to, to try to get all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah, the long and the short of it is, is that, um, you know, we don't make children contribute to daycare expenses, their babies or their toddlers. I think we yeah. should, though. Yeah. Well, I think we're, we're being easy on them. You're right, Bill. Um, but in any I think other, a three year old should have to get a job. Yeah. I think, <laughs> you know, if you can walk, you should contribute. That's Absolutely. Right. You should be delivering exactly. papers. Exactly. Like, you know, I, I, I started working when I was like two. So yeah, I can barely speak. But, you know, child labor is a good thing. But anyway, at the end of the day, I'm being sarcastic. Um, these expenses, because the child is now at a point where they're almost an adult, and in some cases are an adult, we do expect contribution. And um, what I'm talking about are things like tuition um, on our list. So that would mean that um, obviously whatever the school is going to charge you, um, there are other expenses the school charges for, like, you know, health yeah. plans and a gym membership and whatever else, but we're talking about that bill and that, that bill and not, not our bill, but that bill is going to be something that the parents and the child will yeah. have to contribute to. Um, and you will have to contribute pro proportionally to after child's contribution. So for example, if expenses are $15,000 a year and the agreement is child will contribute a third. There's 5,000 gone. Now there's 10,000 left parents will contribute proportionally to whatever the 10,000 is left over. Um, this will include books. Uh, that's something your child needs for school to be successful. Do they still um, have books? Well, you know what? There's a lot of virtual books. And I think that a lot of people- uh, Just think, wondering, it's been a while. Since yeah, I, I think they prefer- I haven't it. been to university since the 50s. Well, uh, things have changed, Bill, but not, 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 not a lot. There's, a, there's still reading. Um, accommodation. That could be rent. That could be a uh, residence. Um, you're expected to contribute to this as well. Um, and uh, food plans. Obviously, your child's got to eat. Um, so expected to contribute to that. Um, you know, transportation and vehicle costs. We're talking about child getting around. If they need like a bus pass. We're also talking about child coming home to visit. So sometimes there's circumstances where your child has to go to school very far away. Uh, they have to go to school in, in you know, a different country. Uh, if they want to come home and visit, that's reasonable. So you will contribute to those transportation costs. Um, so will child, but that's what happens. Um, cell phone, again, we're talking about success of school. We're talking about success of child. We're talking about an idea that, 
you know, we want better for our children than ourselves, or if we got our own education, we want our children to get the same education. So, um, you know, take what Bill said earlier, within reason and what you can afford, but these are the expectation or these are contributions. Entertainment as well. Like, I mean, I'll give an example. You can have a child who first year lived in residence, but second year made friends and decided to go live in an apartment with them. You got to contribute to rent. They don't have a health plan anymore, so you got to contribute to food. And then even if you did contribute to residence costs and health plan first year and rent and, and food and second year, your child, I mean, I know they should be studying, but they want to do fun things with friends. Their friends are going out. If they have no money of their own or everything they saved, they contributed already for their third. Think about that. There's still money being floated over to the child. If they want to go to pub night, if they want to go to a movie, if they want to go for dinner with their friends, like, you know, school is a social uh, uh, thing as well. And you make connections there for life sometimes. So uh, yeah, all uh, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Exactly. So I think that you know, like these these are not things we want to pay for because they're expensive, yeah. but they're they're reasonable. They make sense. They're logical. They they, they speak yeah. to a child's success. And uh, again, what we want, but you know, within reason. And and I think that you know, when when people really struggle is when you have two children at school, the cost mount. Um, it's very expensive. Um, you know, I've had judges say to me, the weird thing about all of this is, is that if the two of you were still together and you couldn't afford to send the kids to school, yeah. you'd make your own decision and one of you would win. But you've separated, you have, you have two residences, less money to go around than before. And now I get to decide whether you can contribute to this or not. And, and you know, that's ridiculous. Um, but someone's got to make the decision sometimes. And uh, in my yeah. experience, uh, they put a huge, huge benefit on these, an education for a child. So expect to pay something. Yeah. And that, that leads us to, thank you, Jason and Susanna. Um, the next topic um, is child support uh, during uh, post-secondary education. And uh, uh, I'm talking about table amount of child support. And basically the, correct me if I'm wrong, but the rule um, is, if the child stays at home to go to university, then there probably will be a table amount as well as the the uh, the extra expenses because they're still at home. Yeah. Um, if the child goes away to, to university, then no table amount while they're away. But if they come back for the summer, then during the summer, they probably will. I think Divorce Mate even has a, a thing called the summer formula. Yes. Um, so um, I think everyone kind of knows that. Um, gap years. Now, this was a, a, an issue that came up with me and Suzanne. I remember that. How long can a child drop out of university and then come back and expect the parents to, to start paying again? And I did some research on that. What I found was one gap year, no problem. For sure, you can take a year off. The, the kid can. Um, Beyond a year, it gets a little iffy. Um, I, I found case law where a year and a half was considered okay. And then I found case law that, that said three years is too long. So that's kind of the range. It, it depends on particular circumstances, of course, but that's, that's what I found out. Um, and there's, uh, there's something called the Farden factors, which I think all the lawyers have heard about, F-A-R-D-E-N. You can search it, you'll find it. Um, it was a case of, I think it was decided by a British Columbia master, not even a judge, but somehow it got adopted by judges across the country. And the interesting part of the, of the Farden factors to me, there's two points that I think are interesting. Number one, the kid has to be in a legitimate education it has to be there has to be a plan that's going to lead to a job you can't do a degree in basket weaving uh, and expect uh, um, the parents to pay um, and the other uh, interesting point is what phil epstein used to call the parent as wallet and that means the kid doesn't talk to the parent kid hates the parent kid still wants the parent to pay for university and that can be problematic. And there are uh, lots of cases where the judges said, you know what, um, because the, the kid unilaterally terminated the relationship with the parent, 
then the parent doesn't have to pay for the university. But it's important um, that the kid did it unilaterally. Uh, it's not always ruled that way, but uh, uh, the parent as well, in cases there is uh, an argument to be made that if, if your kid uh, cuts off contact with you unilaterally, then you might not have to pay for their university. It's a sad issue. Um, have you ever run into that one, either of you? In, in that case, you were talking about Bill, the case you did research on. Oh, the gap year um, case? Yeah. Yeah, there were two kids. And so the one kid had some mental health issues and he was really struggling through school. He had a issue with attendance as well, which, you know, the court came down on mom for because she was the primary parent and the kid was supposed to be in school. Right, I remember. Um, but he took a really long time to finish high school and ended up in alternative programs and all of that to complete his GED beyond 18. And dad was required to pay child support because of those issues. But the other child, she was living in mom's house as well, but from the age of 14, her boyfriend, who was several years older, moved in. They had a kid. She was in and out of school, uh, continued to complete her GD with a few years gap in between and working part time and all of that and wanted dad to continue to pay support. And the judge said, no, that just that was not happening. The judge ended child support right. at a reasonable age. Um, I remember that, and that, that actually illustrates um, that it's, it is dependent on the facts Absolutely. of the case. And if you've got a situation where, like you said, the first um, child had some, some uh, issues uh, uh, that they were dealing with, that, that does change it. I mean, yeah. it wasn't just taking a, gap, a couple of years off to go to Thailand and ride an elephant for fun. I mean, it wasn't like that. So, Yeah, because a I lot of remember. parents... A lot of parents ask, hey, how long, like, when does child support end, right? So it's important to know that in, in many, many cases, it's just dependent on the facts. It, it really is. But um, certainly, uh, I, I think generally nowadays, the uh, certainly you can get, you, in most cases, you can get two degrees out of your parents. Not one, but two. Um, well, it also depends on... The parents' educational background too, right? And what expectations they have for for their kids. They right. you might be dealing with uh, two doctors. Yeah, I exactly. Mean, one size doesn't fit all. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, yeah, these things, these issues are complicated. Yeah, um, you know, people are asking questions in the uh, of us uh, in question yeah. and answer about what happens if a child can go to school locally, but they've been accepted at a school that's far away, and what can I do about that? And I think that. Now, the answer to that question is, is that you're paying child support already. It's a contribution to food, clothing, and shelter. You have to pay for these expenses. It might be reduced. That's what Bill's trying to talk about, children that go away to school. Why should you pay full table amount if your child's not living at home for those months? So there'd be a reduction. Well, instead of paying full table support plus residence, you might get a reduction. Yeah. But you might pay full table support and tuition if your child stays at home. Yeah. A a judges are not always sympathetic to your plight as far as finances, but if you legitimately cannot afford a, for a child to go to school, because some cases it's $25,000 per year per child yeah. um, after tax, which is a lot of money for a lot of people, um, they do listen. And so in that example where a child could go home, stay at home, but wants to go away, it's gonna be done the facts. Maybe they can't take the same course at home, but if yeah. they can, maybe a judge could consider a contribution based on child living at home. And that's your contribution. And the child and the other parent have to find out the difference um, if they really want that child to go away. Um, judges can cap what you can contribute. They're not going to make you contribute what you can't. So yeah, that's Jason, a, that's a, that's a, sorry. sorry, Bill. Jason, what about looking at what the local university would cost and maybe ordering a parent to pay based on that? That's what I mean. Like, I think they would say, okay, like if your child lived at home, your contribution would be X. Mm -hmm. and uh, your, your, your child support would be why, this is how much it's going to cost you annually. So uh, I'm gonna make you contribute that. And if other parent and child wanna make up the difference and find a way for a child to go away to school, have at it. But yeah. this is what I'm ordering because this is all a parent can afford to contribute yeah. and uh, good luck. 
Well, thanks, Jason. And um, I think it might be a good time to move on to the questions. We've got some that we had already and there's some coming in. So um, before we do that. Um, Bill? Yes. Can you take the question about what happens when a child withdraws as a result of parental abuse? With, withdraws uh, from school? From parental control. I would oh. imagine that's what they're referring to. We were talking about, oh, yeah, you yeah, know, right. using using a parent as a wallet, right? But you withdrawn. I think you don't want a relationship. Yeah. I, well, again, the Farden factor is it has to be the child unilaterally terminating uh, the relationship. I'm not sure that they were talking about abuse. That that's not what happened in in, in that case. So um, I've that's never that's actually that. run into that, Jason. That's not unilateral then, because clearly the parent. Uh, if they were being abused. that's a good point it's not unilateral if you're being abused it's involving themselves uh, yeah. in their relationship with the child in a negative way and the child i've never run into that yeah hope i never do yeah I, and there was another question too about you know the reason for the child choosing to cut off that contact and one point we've consistently made in this webinar is each family is different and the judge looks at all the factors in your particular case, it's not a, a cookie cutter order that you're going to get at the end of the day. So yes, the reason that the child chose to withdraw may be yeah, relevant. That, I think that's right. And it's like Jason said, it's not one size fits all, but it is an issue. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to continue to be an issue, I think. Yeah. So uh, Shannon, did you want to talk about the ebook? Or do you want me to? Yeah, um, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, thank, you. thank you, Bill, Jason, and Susanna. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Um, just before we get into Q&A, though, I just wanted to mention to our audience that there will be a survey that pops up in your browser following the webinar. Um, and this is, it'll just ask you some questions asking you to provide your feedback on today's presentation. So please, if you have the time, we welcome and appreciate any feedback you have. It really helps us grow our event series. Um, and gives us an insight into our audience. So if you have the time, we'll really appreciate that. Um, and as a sign of our appreciation, we'll be offering you a complimentary ebook on divorce, parenting, and self-help. Um, so if you have the time, again, just please do that. Um, but without further ado, um, we have a lot of audience questions that have come in. So again, just want to thank everyone for your participation and sending those in. Um, looks like we have almost 10 minutes to get through some questions. So we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. First question I have here is, my child has been accepted to an expensive university. Can I make the other parent pay? Yeah. Who wants to take that one? I think Jason touched on it previously, right? Yeah, we talked a bit about that, that if you, you know, expensive university or going out of town, same idea, um, same, same, I believe, similar question. And I think that you can afford what you can afford. And uh, if you can't afford it, they're not going to drive you into bankruptcy to pay for it. I would hope not, but I'm saying judges aren't always sympathetic to your plight. Yeah. If we listened to every person that couldn't afford to pay support or pay for this, then no one would ever pay anything. So, um, you know, you will uh, be put under the microscope and you will mm -hmm. have to defend your position about why. But um, hypothetically, there is the remedy that this is all I can contribute. This is what I have. And you can't get blood from a stone. So take it. And the judge says, yeah, that's what we order. But there is the possibility the judge orders a number beyond what you can afford to. Well, you can't own, you know, three or four multi-million dollar properties and come to court and say, I can't pay, right? You will be Agreed. put under the microscope. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. You know, or you own your own business and your income is declared as $10,000, but you own those properties, like Susanna said. And it's driving a Lamborghini. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about the, the question that talks about does the proportionate split need to be dealt with at the time of incurring the expense or later during taxes? Because we haven't talked about contributing to the net cost, right? And how do you figure that out? Well, I think normally these expenses, we don't talk about it as much as we should, but there are the net costs. So you do have to consider taxes. You have to consider um what the net number will be. I mean, the normal example we have is not back to school, but daycare, daycare expenses. There is a, a deduction allowed for them and that has a net effect on your taxes. And so that's the net number you're supposed to be contributing. If you both contribute directly and you claim it, then 
<clears throat> problem solves. But if one person claims it, then you're supposed to be considering the net cost. And yes, you do get a tax credit for these tuition costs. Um, child usually has to claim it first. And if child uses it all up, too bad. If child doesn't use it all up because they didn't make any income, then it can be transferred to parent, it can be transferred to their own partner if they have a partner, it can be transferred to grandparent. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it is uh, something that, um, yeah, would affect the, the bottom line. And you need to look at those bottom lines more than anything else. The net uh, number. Exactly. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, another question we have here is, are uniforms considered special expenses or are they covered under regular child support? That's a tough one. Yeah. I think it depends on the cost of the uniforms, right? Is it an exorbitant amount or is it something that can be reasonably covered under child support? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's like clothing. Um, so that's yeah. one, one, one argument. Um, some private schools require you to be uniform. Yeah. And some Catholic schools require you to be uniform. And, uh, you know, I think there's obviously different costs associated with both yeah. and what they're prepared to give you. But, um, you know, uh, look, we're talking about special and extraordinary expenses. So cost is always an issue. Um, if it's $100, it's not special and extraordinary. Right. Um, if it's you know, 5,000, yeah, now we're talking about special and extraordinary. Yeah. That's the actual definition, like special and extraordinary. But, you know, what I tell people is, is if you share the kids equally, if you, you know, agreed that you would share all the parenting time equally, $100 maybe should be split equally. And it shouldn't just be absorbed by one parent all the time. There's another one here about if you've equalized your income based on a 50-50 NDI, why would Section 7 still be proportionate? I think I understand the question. I think that, you know, the problem is, is that the software we use to determine NDI is net disposable income. So it's, it's the question saying we already have the same money left over at the end of the month. And so if we have the same money left over in the month and we've, we've equalized that monthly income we have and net number, why are we then proportionally splitting section sevens? Well, the proportion may be 50-50, to be honest, like, you know, who knows, right? The software will do that for us. Sometimes a payment, um, of, of uh, you know, of, of, of support. Um, the software says, okay, well, we're going to move it around for taxes. It, it does a lot more work than I can do in my mind at one given time, no matter how much paper and pencil I have. So uh, I think to answer your question, um, you're talking about NDIs, that's dealing with the software. You plug that in. A lot of people don't consider the expenses for children like this, special for expenses when they do the NDI. Once you start plugging it in, it would readjust possibly the support numbers because if, for example, spousal is being paid, it gets paid last. So if you have a child support payment being made and then these special external expenses and one parent paying a lot more than they should be than the other parent because they have a higher income, that could affect spousal. So I think you're, you're kind of saying we've gone to the bottom and we figured this all out. So why aren't we just 50-50? And I'm saying you missed a step, go back up plug it in, and then you make it to the bottom and have very different numbers at the end of the bottom. I hope I haven't created more trouble than, than help there, but that's the idea, is that these expenses get paid before spousal. They get paid after child support, and they're, that's that's the step. And that could affect proportionality after that. Yeah, when, I, when I've done that calculation in the software, it's basically for the purposes of spousal, right? It doesn't have anything to do with Section 7. Section 7 is still based on your gross, just like child support would be. Yeah. If in doubt, just blame divorce mate. That, that works for me. <laughs> Thank you. Together. I believe we have time for one last question. Susanna, is there another question there that's come in live that you'd like to address before we sign off today? Not, I have one here, One another question cool. from the audience. Go ahead, so, Shannon, yeah. Okay. Um, so how are post-secondary edu education costs calculated if one parent is unemployed? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I can answer all this and try. I think you, that, are the, you are the guru. Well, uh, whatever. It's uh, too, much, too much energy coming off my head and there's nothing left on it. Anymore. No, it's, I'm, I'm being <laughs> educated here. Talk. Okay. I think, again, one size doesn't always fit all. So um, why yeah. are they unemployed? Um, that's the question, really. 
It could be physical, it could be mental, it could be something else. And, uh, you know, we have the ability in law to impute income to people if they're purposely unemployed uh, or underemployed. So I yeah. think that's the question. That's if the they're question. unemployed for good yeah. reason, you may be looking at their contribution being zero. Yeah. If they're unemployed for a bad reason, a yeah. judge can impute an income to them, plug that into the equation and say, this is your contribution, whether you earn that money or not. I think because, that's you know, bang I'm going to quit my job. I'm not going to take care of my child or my or my spouse. You can't do that. They don't like that. Agreed. No. Right. Thank you so much. Thanks, I Jason and Susanna. You appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thank you very much. We talk about these things for another hour if we have the time. Yeah, thank you again, Susanna, Jason, and Bill. We hope that everyone has found this informative, and we just want to thank all of you again for joining us today. We really appreciate your participation and um, and your contribution to our event series. Um, as I mentioned, there will be a survey following the webinar. So please, if you have the time, we love hearing your feedback. And just a note that we will be uh, sending an email out tomorrow with additional resources on today's topic and also information about our upcoming presentations. We host our virtual event series bi-weekly on Wednesdays at 12 p.m. on a variety of family law topics. And our next presentation will be on Wednesday, September 7th, with a presentation on establishing a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. And we also have an exciting event happening later in September as an extension of our virtual event series. We'll be hosting a two-day Family Now Live summit, a virtual summit on Wednesday, September 21st, and Thursday, 20, September 22nd, sorry. Um, and that, um, on those days, we'll be offering two full days of presentations, again, on a variety of family law topics, and we'll be including more information for you in tomorrow's email, so stay tuned for that. And again, we just want to thank all of you for joining us, and we hope you have a great day. Bye, everyone.